I can't read the slide, says the guy with his glasses on top of his head. <laughs> yeah, those are for up close, aren't they? Then I guess you need to put them on and get up close to the screen so you can see it. No. <laughs> I pick on John because I care. I appreciate all the work he does and um, putting things together for our worship services and the assignments and making sure that everything is done well, and he does a fantastic job. I know he's busy with his work and with his family, and uh, but he, he continues to uh, be very diligent and appreciate uh, the efforts he makes on behalf of the kingdom here. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at the book of James. We're not only going to be looking at it, we're going to be reading all of it this evening. Uh, five brothers are going to be coming up to read a chapter apiece, and we are uh, going to be blessed by hearing this exceptionally practical book. Shall we pray before we begin? Thank you, Father, so much for the many ways that you have blessed us, for the many ways that you have shown your love to us. Thank you for the amazing instruction that you bring to us from your word, especially in this glorious book of James. Father, the practical instruction we received from there could only have come from you, and we thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus who makes all of these things possible, makes it possible for us to live according to the things we read that are found here. Help us, Father, as we engage with this beautiful book tonight, to take it to heart, to seek to make correction where necessary and strengthen the places where we're already following, and bless us as we hear and as we read tonight in Jesus' name, amen. James is named for the author of the book, the half-brother of Jesus. We know it was the half-brother of Jesus and not the Apostle James, for a couple of reasons, the Apostle James was dead long before this was written. Could not have been written by uh, James, the son of Zebedee. Uh, James, the less, has never been uh, cited with authorship of any of our letters or books, and his name has never really been bantered about as far as uh, the authorship of this book. When you consider uh, the statement made by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1.19 regarding James, the brother of Jesus, being a leader in the church. Uh, this would be his half-brother. They shared uh, the mother, Mary. He would have been among the brothers of Jesus who were not believers for a large portion of Jesus' ministry. We don't know exactly when James became a believer, when he was immersed, when he became faithful in following Jesus. But once he did, he never looked back. And he was uh, instrumental in helping lead the church in Jerusalem as well as what we find here in the book of James. This is one of our earliest writings it dates somewhere around the year 49. So it is very early as far as the New Testament writings that we have. Some believe it was the first of the New Testament writings that we have. The recipients would have been Jewish converts who lived outside of Palestine with the purpose to challenge them to possess an active faith, not a dead faith, one that will produce real changes in a person's life, in their conduct, and in their character. The key verses found in James, there are three that I've identified. 117, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. 127, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And finally, chapter 2 and verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, 
So faith without works is dead also. At this time, we will have the reading of the book of James, beginning with chapter 1. Chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, You sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? 
Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of the all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do commit murder or adultery, but do not commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who, who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merci merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may dwell, say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is, is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of that works, faith was perfect, perfected and the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the heavier judgment. For in many things we offend or stumble all. If any man offend or stumble, not in word, the same is perfect, a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the steer steersman wills. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasts great things. Behold how much wood, how great a matter, a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, of birds, serpents, creeping things, of all the things in the sea that is tamed, has been tamed of man. But the tongue can no man tame. It's unruly, evil, restless, full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse man, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain 
yield both salt water and fresh water. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his good life, his works, with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and jealousy, strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, it is earthly, sensual, devilish, demonical. For where envying strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and variance, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. 
As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Thank you, brothers. May God bless the reading of his word. There's just something about hearing God's word read out loud. It, it is, it's important to hear those words, not just to read them. Some people are challenged visually. Some people are challenged with their hearing. Other people are challenged when they can engage with their hands. But every time that you have an opportunity to engage all three of those aspects of learning together, it, it helps to increase what we hear and what we learn. James, as you could see, I don't know how many of you got to a certain point and then started dwelling on something that was there. I found myself doing that a couple of times and had to get caught back up with the readers because there's so much practical information that's found in the book of James. Just day in and day out practical Christianity. And if there's something there that, that it was a special thought to you, then you may have found that and, and started to, to dwell and reread some of that as the brothers were reading through the book of James. I want us to consider some things from chapter 1, and these are marks of true religion. You know, everybody has their own ideas of what religion is, but I, I want us to just spend a few moments in chapter 1 and look at the marks of true religion. In verses 2 through 4, we see that joy and patience in trials is one of the marks of true religion. Now, I, I can honestly say this is an area where I have always struggled. I have always struggled with this. I'm, I'm a fixer. Anybody else in here a fixer? Yeah, being patient in trials is not my specialty. I'm looking for a way to fix it, you know. I just I, I want to fix it, make it go away, and then we can move on to something else. And so I, this is something that I have personally struggled with, but yet it is a mark of true religion. I am a lot better at it than I used to be, but I'm nowhere near where I need to be. Secondly, verses 5 through 8 is an unwavering faith and a singleness of mind. It's interesting where we see there, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But what do we normally do when we need wisdom? We still try to figure it out ourselves, and then we go to God after we've made a mess. Instead of going to God first, asking for wisdom as we enter into a situation. But that's, that's typically human nature. That's how we do it. And we take our human nature and we bring it into Christianity and we say, I love you, God. I appreciate the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf, but I think I've got it from here. And then we make a mess out of it, and we've got to come back and go, uh, I didn't really have it, uh, but I kind of need some wisdom now. 
Well, sometimes our experience teaches us wisdom. And maybe uh, God's helping us with that. Verses 9 through 11, another mark of true religion is the acceptance of God's provision. Just as the grass grows and is burned up by the sun and it goes away and then it comes back and goes away, so are the things of this world where humans are concerned. Our riches, you know, everything that we have is a gift from God. And it's all going to perish. I had a scarf that my mother got me when I started to school at Auburn University in 1982. And it was nice. It was very nice. It was wool. It was Christian Dior. I don't know if if they're still making any Christian Dior stuff anymore. I don't know. I don't keep up with that anymore. But it was important when I was 20. And it was a great scarf because, I mean, it, it would keep keep you warm but it was also stylish i really liked it and we had to store our stuff for a time and it was in uh, a dresser but it was not in a climate controlled area and what have you and then about a year later i went to get it out and it looked like swiss cheese you know the things that we have in this life that we think are important that we think are lasting are not going to last Nothing in this building, the building that we're going to be building, uh, the house that you live in, the vehicles that you drive, the clothes that you wear, all those things will, the moth or the rust or a thief, those things will all go away eventually. Or in the end, when the Lord comes, everything you know will be consumed and uh, we'll be off to be with him. But we need to accept the provision that God offers us. Fourth, Endurance in temptation. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. I don't want to endure it. I just want it to go away. How about you? Right? But that's not God's plan for us sometimes. Sometimes it will just go away, but other times it stays there. And you know, one of the the beautiful things, there are a lot of things in nature that we understand, like a diamond. How is a diamond formed? It's not by some Jewish guy up in New York City that with a little with his eyepiece. He just helps to cut so you can see the clarity and the beauty of the diamond. How is the diamond itself formed in the ground? With a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. And if we want to be diamonds in the sight of God, we have to endure that pressure. Because that pressure helps to make us what we are supposed to be. We have to endure. That is a mark of true religion. But also recognizing the source of temptation. Verses 13 through 15 is a mark of true religion. God is not tempting us with evil. Nor can he be tempted by evil. But we understand that Satan is active in this world. And Satan knows where you are weak. He knows where you are enticed. And just like someone would go fishing for a fish, he throws out the bait. And our own desires then tempt us to take the bait. That's what James is telling us. We're tempted by our own desires. And when we give in, that's when things go bad. And ultimately, if we don't receive forgiveness for those things, it's going to end in spiritual death but just as we need to recognize the source of these temptations we also need to recognize the design source of all blessings those things come from the father of lights from above every good and every perfect gift verses 16 through 18 what does every leave out doesn't leave anything out It's not 99%. It's not 60%. It's 100%. Every good gift, good by God's definition of what is good. Good by the perfect gift, by his definition of what the perfect gift is. Not by man's definition. Those things come from God. Again, that kind of ties in with what we talked about this morning about our thankfulness in all circumstances. 
Another mark of true religion found in verses 19 and 20 is spiritual hearing, deliberate speech, and patience when we are provoked. James packs a lot into a couple of verses right there. Be slow to speak. Be swift to hear. Be slow to wrath. You've probably heard it before, and I don't know who was the first one to come up with it besides what James says here, but God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You need to be listening twice as much as you speak. And, you know, it might even be exponentially more than that we need to listen more than we speak because we really get ourselves in trouble when we speak, and we get over into chapter 3, and what do we see about the tongue? The tongue is uh, the, the source of many of our problems. Certainly. Verse 21, another mark of true religion is to forsake all evil and to meekly, gently receive the truth, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I love God's word. That's why I've dedicated my life. I love God's word. And you know what I love about God's word is it doesn't change. Everything else changes. Everything else changes. I I used to have a different color hair. Our sister Esther came to the door. I said, how are your eyes? She said, I can see you're not gray anymore. And I said, well, I wish it looked that way when I looked in the mirror. But she's been looking through that haze for so long. Everything appeared gray. And she was talking about how she could see colors and all the flowers that are blooming. And what a great blessing it is that uh, we've been allowed to discover those advances in surgeries. But, you know, everything changes. Everything does. God's word doesn't change. And it is as applicable in 2018 as it was when it was written. It doesn't, it's not just seasonal. It's not just tied to a a point in time. And though it is available in over 170 languages, when translated out of those languages, it all says the same thing. It doesn't change. We can go back to the original languages Study those languages and see that what we have here is what was written. It doesn't change, and it is that which is able to save our souls. Verse 25 says another mark of true religion is the searching after truth, and then once we find it, not doing anything about it. Is that what it says? Oh, no. When you find the truth, you practice it. You do it. Verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not for a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You know, it's... You know what the easiest thing to do with God's word is? To read it and say, Ken needs to do that. Tana needs to do that instead of looking in the mirror and saying, I need to do that, right? That's the easiest thing in the world to do is to tell everybody else what they need to be doing, but yet when you look in the mirror, you know what you find out? This is for you. You need to be paying attention to it. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 that before we judge someone, we need to get that log out of our eye, that plank. Because until we do that, we're not going to be able to see clearly to get the speck out of somebody else's eye. We've got to be really careful about that. But we need to search after truth and practice it. And finally, in verse 27, the practical philanthropy and purity is a mark of true religion. As a matter of fact, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. And he defines it for us. Man has made religion into a lot of different things. But ultimately, it's about two things. It's about having the right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 
and it's about having a right relationship with your fellow human beings on this earth. When you see a need, you help to meet that need. Even if you can't physically do it yourself and you know someone who can, you understand that it is your responsibility to see about taking care of that need. Chapter 2 reflects upon chapter 1 and expresses that an inactive faith is a contradiction in terms. Because that faith is dead. There's no such thing as an inactive faith. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So as you look at chapter 1, chapter 1 gives us the marks of true religion, shows us how we should be living our lives, the things that we need to be focused upon in our life so that we can grow and become that which God has called for us to become. Appreciate your indulgence tonight in this wonderful book of James. Thank you to the five brothers who read for us tonight. I would encourage you to spend a lot of time in the book of James because it is so practical. It does come straight to the heart it will prick your heart because as you read it you go "Uh oh that's me you'll find a lot of things in there that some of our writings in our new testament are you kind of scratch your head because they're a little bit heavier on the doctrine um, and you have to really think through those things you don't really have to think through what james is saying it's just right in your face and it's beautiful God loves us enough to just throw it out there and say, here it is. Take it and run with it. And that's our charge tonight. If you're here tonight as a Christian and maybe you see some things in the book of James that you need to fix, uh, our brothers prepared a song for us. Uh, We invite you to come during this song, and we'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you and encourage you tonight. Or if you're here tonight and you've never named the name of Christ, you've never put him on in baptism, we'd love to talk with you about that as well. But if you have a need tonight as we sing this song, please make that need known to us. Let us stand and sing.